and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast, produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet, in our opinion, of course. I am Bob, exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team, and I'm going to be your host today, and I'm joined again by Chris, the pharmacist. One of the smartest guys I know. That's my tagline with him. <laughs> and he's today going to talk about understanding the pharmacology of benzodiazepines. Did I say benzodiazepines, right? yep. And how to reduce anxiety. And it also can help us sleep, correct? It sure can. All right. So let's get started. Um, what what role does this drug play? I, I, we, you know, we had another video where we talked about the SSRIs. Yep. Uh, you maybe want to tell what that is real quick. Yeah. No. And what the, the benzo diet. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we're dealing with anxiety specifically, anxiety is an awful, awful feeling. And there are several different forms of anxiety, but, you know, most commonly is general uh, anxiety disorder. But the reality of it is, is when f- people feel like garbage, you know, you're talking about one in five Americans. So that is a lot of people, upwards of 50 million people. Uh, Americans experience anxiety, and it's horrible. And worse this year. Yep, seems to be a lot worse this year. 2020 has been a highly unique year for that, and then at least my pharmacy, I'm seeing more of these drugs going out left and right. Than ever. But, you know, the, you yep, I would say so. I mean, in my, you know, it's not scientific, but I mean, sure. I, I mean we've taught like, my, my like staff, it. we kind of talking like, wow, we're really kicking these out. Um, but the reality of it is, is, you know, when we have anxiety, the mainstay of therapy is either talking with your doctor, well, first seeing your doctor, because we need to know if there's a physical underlying cause, uh, you know, certain medications can cause it, thyroid condition can cause it, cardiac conditions, there's a lot of other things. So once we establish it's nothing physical that's causing it, and it is anxiety, you know, and you're having these horrible thoughts, what they say most days of the week for six months, which again, in my opinion, is way, way too, too long. long. Right. Um, you know, they would start you on either ther- cognitive behavioral therapy or the SSRIs, which are the serotonin, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Do they start the cognitive behavior therapy right away or do they wait until the medication has started to kick in? No, I think, you know, a lot of times the doctor, if the patient, you know, the patient drives the bus. I mean, sure. the, the therapy is centered around what the patient's willing to do. And so if, if you're willing to go through therapy, which I think is one of the best things out there because it's non-drug, um, you know, the, the cognitive behavioral therapy basically teaches you and they have very skilled clinicians that are going to help you to teach you to replace the negative horrible thoughts with positive ones to help you to kind of balance things out and understand why those feelings occur when you're having those negative thoughts so that we can kind of come to a better place where you can kind of control it more naturally. I've Uh, seen the studies where you take one drugs or you take the therapy and you know they both can help but together that's they're far more effective and i think it's widely underutilized aspect of our healthcare community and i think counselors have a lot to offer and and i would hope that you know unfortunately there's been a stigma with mental illness and people like well i don't need that kind of help well i think the much less but it's it's it's, yeah and and, you know we have to crash that door down i mean it's 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 something that that people need to take advantage of because it's there for them and it's helpful and they leave lasting beneficial results for the rest of your lives. So whether what, it's, what about uh, like meditation, does that fall in that same category? Yeah, mindfulness and meditation actually are all within that. And, you know, it's interesting. There's books about it. There's, you know, you can go to, you know, group talks about it. Um, sometimes, you know, there's apps on your phone that you mm-hmm. can actually utilize. And for some people, they're wonderful opportunities to help you to help mitigate and manage uh, anxiety. But, you know, sometimes we just need the medications. And so, and it's just, sometimes that's the easier choice. Maybe you've got three small kids that are running in five different directions, although with COVID, it's a little bit different these days, but, you know, it might not be optimal for you to go in and see a counselor. So medications certainly help. And a lot of times they'll start you on the SSRI or even the SNRIs, um, but that point, those take time to work, like four to six it's weeks. a long time to work. So yeah. that's where the benzodiazepines kick in. And so those are the ones that work immediately, but they have a strong negative connotation. They are addictive. We have to be careful with them. Tolerance develops, and there's lots of side effects that are associated with them. So they're just a small stopgap. Typically, could a dependence occur? Uh, within a couple of weeks. 
So sure. it doesn't take long. Usually most clinicians only so want... So if you took it every day for a couple of weeks, you mean? Yeah, I mean, people can if they need to. And again, it's kind of intermittent. You want to, There's a phrase that doctors put on prescriptions called PRN. It stands for as needed. Uh, it's actually just a derivative of Latin. But, you know, a lot of times these drugs, depending upon which one, whether it's lorazepam, clonazepam, diazepam, you know, alprazolam, those are the ones that are most... Com those are the four most commonly used ones. And there are others, many others, actually. And they all have different potencies and lengths of action. Um, so a doctor is going to certainly listen to you and make sure that there's something appropriate. And, and if, if it's something that's like, I am just so panicky, I'm going to just explode. I mean, I think sometimes clinicians will say, you know, I think it is reasonable for you to consider taking a make benzo. That bridge. And yeah, let's yeah. get you something so that we can help you to relax, get you the sleep so that your brain can recover, so that we can wait for the other drugs to kick in or your therapy to begin to help you. So uh, it's, it's a short term. A, yeah, I have a, a family member. I'm not going to mention her name, but she... Um, she had cancer, and uh, so they actually let her be on the clonazepam mm -hmm. uh, the entire time. Sure. Uh, and it's funny, you know, she she got off it fairly easy. She did pretty well with it. Um, she said, I really don't like how I feel on it, so it was easy for me to get off, but apparently yep. she didn't get dependent upon yeah. her. Yeah, well, you know, and the things that drive addiction are, you know, there's a genetic predisposition right, to a lot right, of these exactly. things. And so, and again, your clinician is very skilled at looking for these cues. And so they have to assess you every time you come in. And so you're meeting with a doctor, you know, in some cases, monthly, three months, six months, sure. depending upon the circumstances that they deem appropriate for your particular situation. And so they're going to be looking for those cues and seeing what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. The generalized guidelines are you only want to take it for a couple two to four weeks. And actually, if you take it for as long as four weeks, then you have to actually taper off it at about a rate 25% per you know sure. week to step down safely because you could have withdrawal effects and that can be very very serious even to the point where uh, severe withdrawal with benzo could actually create a uh, cardiac type of emergency oh my god so yeah. it's things that clinicians are very very careful very with when they're when they're treating their patients and you know us as pharmacists in the community we're kind of looking at to see refill patterns how they're doing you know we want to make sure that they're safe with their medication they're used making sure they're tolerating everything okay not having problems with dizziness drugs Drowsiness, falling asleep at work, you know. So there's, a, and those are the main. That's why they work, is they make you tired, but they can make you dizzy and they can make you drowsy. So they're How used. How long are they in your system? I mean, well, and again, that kind of depends. You have some of the more. Which one you use? Yeah. So clonazepam, much longer. Diazepam, even longer. Uh, things like lorazepam and alprazolam, much shorter. But the problem with you know the shorter acting potent benzos is they can cause rebound anxiety. So these things are not designed to be used. They're just a stopgap until hopefully other measures will take place and really help to the patient to safely manage their anxiety symptoms. Yeah, the same girl would use it uh, when she fly because sure. she, she had a fear of flying. Yep. And, and, very uh, reasonable fear. That's help. a phobia. Yep. So that's an anxiety. Yep. And she would use it for that uh, alone now. And, yep always work quite well. Yeah, and, and so that's a one, I mean, unless she's flying for a living, I mean, right, obviously right. pilots don't get to take it, but it's one of these things where, yeah, people that travel, uh, some people do not like sitting in a tube that's, you know, 44,000 feet in the air. It's not a comfortable feeling for uh, some people. Same storage advice with these? That you, um, yeah, any any medication, really, it comes down to, unless we tell you specifically, to refer, yeah, so it's, it's not in the kitchen, not in the bathroom, because those are the two most moisture prevalent rooms in the house. So you want it to be out of reach of children, and and really somewhere that's cool and dry. So usually it's a bedroom high up where, you know, little kids and pets can't get at it. Sure. Now, um, I, I I saw when I was doing some research, I mean, yeah, there's people that actually had to go to rehab for the, the addiction. Benzos are absolutely dangerous medications when used inappropriately. And so, and that's and again, the key. talked about the genetic portion. Of yeah, the I mean, you know, I, I mean, the science of addiction portion. is really, really, it's it's fascinating and scary all at once. And I mean, there's books and books and programs to help people to try and avoid those perils. But it happens and it happens much more commonly. And right now with COVID, we're seeing even higher addiction rates with other drugs too. And a lot of times benzos are mixed with other products like alcohol or other drugs. And that's where the real dangers be, uh, can set in. You know, an overdose on a benzo can cause respiratory depression and stop your heart from working. 
And you know, I know that's she, it. She talked about alcohol that you just don't want to do that. No, it's you don't it's even want to Yeah, you don't want to go anywhere near yeah. mixing and matching with these types of medications. It, it can be devastating. I mean, you may not wake up depending upon how much you've imbibed. Sure. Uh, so we have to be exceedingly careful, and it's something that you know, as pharmacists, we're kind of looking for that too, because you know, sometimes. You know, we all want to be safe, and you know, sometimes it's an accident, too. I mean, and some of these drugs affect how you think. Uh, and so when we're elderly, yeah, not, it's not something. Not even thinking right. Yeah, right. and so all of a sudden it's like, well, I don't remember if I took one a couple hours ago. I'm going to take another one because I feel panicky. Well, all of a sudden now we've taken three or four doses, sure. and all of a sudden it can have some devastating consequences. Um, you know, and so as we age, I mean, it, it can definitely affect your memory and your cognition. So it, it's certainly something that clinicians, again, they look very, very carefully at their patients. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's some more than others. It just kind of depends. I mean, there's we run into clinical inertia all the time. We see, you know, an 80-year-old lady taking these medications. And uh, is this really the safest thing for you to do? And so it's like, you know, and, and sometimes that's a very hard conversation to have because these people have taken these medications for a number of years, yes. which, again, you know, heard me say earlier, only a couple of weeks. And you heard me just now say right. a couple of years. And so, and again, it's the clinician's responsibility to, to make sure that the patient's using it in a responsible way without the side effects. But sometimes, you know, doctors can be busy and also it's like a quick visit and it's like, uh, you know, oh, yeah. so that one just and got you, by the goal. So many medical issues. There were seven other things on yeah, the, the exactly. docket that you wanted to talk about. And that one just got, it just slid under the rug, so to speak. So I was it's talking to a doctor friend who, has all these little ladies they, they're on ambient and yep. they, they can't they don't want to be they off they don't want to be off no they, nope. they get them to sleep they don't want to get off right? exactly and that's it's, it's one of the hard it's very hard i actually was reading an article last night about you know doctors suggesting how do people stop these things and it's like you know they try it's and difficult say, you know and it is long term it's just, it's not a good solution and so we don't want people on them indefinitely do you have to take these with food or uh, no in a lot of cases it's, it's not the biggest thing we don't want you to you know, just stay away from alcohol uh, sure you know, and so other substances while one. you're on it but you know it can be with without food uh kind of depends on your stomach and you know what your gi tolerances are so if it's it's, it's something that you got a little bit of a touchy tummy, you know, yeah, piece of toast and crackers with that. And sure. always, you know, full glass of water is ideal um, from that regard. But uh, for the most part, there's not a lot of GI side effects. The biggest things that we watch for are central. So it's going to be, you know, the dizziness, the drowsiness, the impaired driving of an automobile. I mean, and that's a big thing with benzos. So you take it with a panic attack and you're, let's say you're at work, you all of a sudden now you got to get home. I, yeah. mean, that's, I mean, taking these types of drugs, if you got in a car accident and the doctor, uh, the police were like, were you on any medications? Well, I just had some little alprazolam yeah, at work. Yeah. That's now a DWI or oh, wow. driving, you know, DUI sure. at that point. And so driving under the influence. Somebody got hurt. You'd be it's devastating. And yeah. I mean, just the, the responses, uh, you know, I mean, it, it can go on forever depending upon how bad the scenario is. So it, it's, these are things that you don't want to drive on because they do affect your coordination. I mean, you wouldn't go out and play baseball or golf on these things because you wouldn't be able to control. Right. You just don't have the coordination physically because of how they work with the polarization in your cells and, and why it relaxes you. I mean, it's also why it works so effectively is because sure. it allows it allows the communication of those nerves to, to work a little bit more efficiently so that they tell your the cells to kind of calm down these uh i imagine there's you know over the counter meds you don't want to take with this too correct there's actually several a lot of the herbal products I'm like sure kava uh, dangerous i mean you need well, to maybe be even some of the antihistamines you slipping. yeah so i, I mean you know, so if you look at let's say benadryl benadryl is kind of the granddaddy right. of all antihistamines what's its number one side effect well it's sedation because it binds the histamine receptor and it makes you sleepy it's also why you don't itch or have allergy sure. symptoms well when we take something that makes you sedate by itself and then we add another ingredient that we'll just pick on alprazolam today uh, that makes you tired we take them both together you see a synergistic response and so what would be maybe somewhat tolerable or okay now all of a sudden becomes wow i am really knocked out so it's not one plus one equals two it might be one plus one e equals six three yeah six. i mean it just wow. depends on your metabolism and wow. the doses of what you've taken so there's a lot of fact your genetics so there's a lot of factors that go into these things and you know these are things that pharmacists talk to you about about, your doctor talks to you about, uh, but you know, there's certain things that, yeah, we just can't, we can't just indiscriminately just medicate with other stuff when we're on certain things. And so that's why I like to think I have a job. I, you know, I encourage everybody, if there's a question, please call. I spent, I am happy to take any phone call anytime, any place, anywhere. Yeah, if they have a question a on something. Job. So we're going to try and minimize those effects just because we want to keep, at the end of the day, we got to keep you safe. Awesome. Number one.
Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, if you got questions, put them in the comments below and we'll, we'll maybe address them in a future video if, if uh, we see the same one popping up a lot so that we know mm -hmm. what people are thinking. All right. Sounds so, great, Bob. Thanks for watching. Thanks a lot.